Coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap, attackers use BGP to redirect and monitor internet traffic. 42 million passwords from a popular dating site are leaked, and the data center that could be coming to a town near you. Plus a great batch of your questions, our answers, and much, much more on this week's episode of TechSnap. And welcome to TechSnap. This is episode 137 of Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly Systems Network and Administration podcast. We stream this episode live on November 21st, 2013. Happy birthday, Angela. This episode is brought to you by our two fine sponsors, GoDaddy.com and Ting.com. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this show goes on. And our live stream, well, that's powered by the incredible Scale Engine over at ScaleEngine.com. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, the admin, the tech, and the teacher, Mr. Alan Jude. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Hey, Alan, guess what? It is what? officially super cold out in the studio. I've got, oh. <laughs> I've got my jacket on. I've got some warm pants on. I've got a heater under the table. I've got my feet sitting on the heater right now, trying to absorb all of the heat possible directly from the heating coil of the heater. But yep. I'm here to do two episodes of TechSnap back-to-back. Yeah, in, I remember how cold it was out in your garage in what was it February last year? I was trying to remember if that's if you were here when or it was this cold. year. It, it, it's like I'm sitting outside. Right. Well, here. I remember for the second episode or for the faux show or something, I wore the big Jupiter Broadcasting sweatshirt. Yeah, it's a lot better. Yeah, uh, the chat room uh, that joins us live is pointing out the fact that I have pants on. It is at least an improvement in itself. Very well put. Yes. Um, you know, I don't know that I've done a. a Episode of Tech Snap with proper pants on in quite a while. Now, BSD Now, uh, that's a pants on kind of show. I mean, let's not yes, kid ourselves. You got sure. Yeah. Uh, well, so I'm looking forward to recording two shows back to back. And I wanted to yep. start with uh, a news headline that you've picked, Alan, that um, sort of casts new light on internet traffic fl- when, uh, for <laughs> malicious data flowing over the internet links and to their targets. Mm. You know, Alan. A little bit. Kind of like maps and stuff. What do we got? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you got uh, maps and so- junks. ThreatPost has a story about uh, some attackers managed to compromise a core router in Mexico. Oh. Uh, and using it, uh, redirect some traffic. Now, <laughs> well, see, sorry, the, also one in uh, Belarus and one in Iceland. Okay. Uh, so basically when they compromise uh, a router that is at some ISP and speaks BGP on the internet, um, what they can do is add an extra route to it. So the way uh, BGP, or the Border Gateway Protocol, is the routing protocol for the internet. And the way it works is each router has a list of networks that it's directly connected to. And it broadcasts those out to all of its peers. And then the peers now know, hey, to get to you know, network 137, uh, I, I know that my neighbor over here has access to that. And then they will pass that, you know, th- so... I say I have access to 137, so I tell all my neighbors, and then my neighbors tell their neighbors, and it goes on and on and on. And then, you know, on the other side of the world, eventually they hear from a probably more than one person that I have a way to get to 137. And then they look at those and decide which one is the cheapest, usually in the number of hops it has to go through. But it might, you know, uh, if they have two links coming into my router and one costs a lot more money, then I will add my um, fake hops to it to make it take longer mm, or mm-hmm. to be, make it look less advantageous. Mm-hmm. So I'll only use it if I have to mm-hmm. if, and, you know, artificially make it more expensive so the other ones will look cheaper. And uh, then it'll find a route and get there. And so what they did here was they managed to break into a router uh, they're not sure if this was happening physically or if they were, you know, compromising them, you know, because their telnet interface is sitting out on the internet or something. <laughs> it depends uh, on a lot of different things. Yeah. But anyway, uh, so they would add a route that wasn't directly connected, but they would tell the router that it was. And so all of a sudden this router in Iceland would start saying, yeah, I have direct access to the network of this bank in the States. <laughs> Mm. And then all the traffic coming from Europe and stuff would be like, hey, it's a lot closer to go to Iceland than go to the bank. So I'm going to go there. (laughs) And now the attackers could then snoop on the traffic uh, on this as it came in and then send it back out and have it eventually actually get to the States where it was supposed to go. Except for as all the traffic is now coming through this router, they can 
visualize it and see what's going on. Ah, interesting. In the end user, since they eventually get to their destination, might not be totally aware. aware. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're doing this over SSL, it's going to be encrypted the whole way, and the man in the middle can't break into the stream. No. I mean, at best, they could just see source destination. Yeah, they can see who's connecting to what and when and, yeah. and how much data is going back and forth. But unless you're the NSA and can crack RC4 encryption in real time, then all you can do is record it and hope to brute force it later. Yeah, store and, store and forward and then uh, have at it you know, when yeah. you have the time. But in general... Uh, you know, if you're using proper SSL with like AES 56 or something, then you're not going to uh, uh, be able to break that. Mm-hmm. But uh, Renesas, which is this company that monitors bits of the internet like this, uh, you remember we did their story about um, how sometimes internet routing is silly, yeah, <laughs> right? Where they found that to get from a from where they were in Los Angeles to a root server that was also in Los Angeles. Uh, it would instead go to a copy of that root server that was in England just because their ISP happened to be connected to that one and not to the other one. Yeah, I remember a t- uh, there was, a, I don't think it's like this anymore, but there was a time when I wanted, when I was in school and I wanted to connect to the school server that was in the same city, but my data would go down to California, you know, through like 14 or 15 hops and then come back to my same town and access the data that I wanted. <laughs> and I well, that, that still happens, you know. Yeah, probably. Going from Toronto to Toronto, I imagine more of the traffic going from Toronto to Toronto actually goes through Chicago than goes through the Toronto Internet Exchange mm. because ISPs have peering policies of, I don't want to peer with anybody because that would be work. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, it probably does still happen. Yep, a lot. Uh, but anyway, so they monitored the Internet for that type of thing. And then they all of a sudden noticed all this weird stuff happening. And so they wrote a report on it. They found that uh, 1,500 different IP blocks uh, had been hijacked uh, for a total of more than 60 days this year. (laughs) Whole blocks of IPs? Well, because that's how BGP works. You can't actually do a BGP route for less than a slash 24. Yeah, true enough. It has to be at least 256 IP addresses. Because that's mostly a legacy rule, but the idea... um, Back in the day, having enough RAM in your router to hold the entire internet routing table was crazy. Hard. Yeah, it was expensive. Yeah, right, because you needed like five hundred and twelve megabytes of RAM when most people had sixty-four. <laughs> right, right. Uh, nowadays, it's not so hard, but the the rule is still there, mostly just to keep that table from being ridiculous. Uh, you know, you try to aggregate the rules into as large a blocks of IPs as you can so that uh, it would all work. Uh, so anyway, the, because of that, there's a rule that you can't do really small blocks. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, Vanessas says that uh, the attacker is getting only one side of the conversation. right? Uh, if they were to hijack the addresses belonging to a web server, like, say, the bank, uh, they would only see the user's requests coming into that web server. You would see the requests for all the pages they want, but when the traffic's going back to the user, the bank would send it via their routers and it would find the best route back to the user. Uh, but if you hijack the IP addresses belonging to the desktops, then you would see all the content coming from the bank to the user, but not the requests. Right? Because the requests would still go out the regular way. Uh, so that's how that would work. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but yes, hopefully at this point, everyone's using encryption for anything important. Mm. You know, Back in the day, people would sign into their email without encryption. They would sign into Facebook without encryption. Well, what so about, what about like, we've seen these stories now where Microsoft and Yahoo have said, and Google's just now implementing this, but Microsoft and Yahoo said, yeah, we're not encrypting when we transmit between our data centers. So even just that kind of stuff where it's like, I'm not even actively involved, but my data could be in transit. Maybe they're just right. doing an offsite replication or something. And um, that might depend to like... Uh, is that a point-to-point link, or is that going over the public internet? Yeah, it's going to write. That's going to vary depending on their how they have it set up. Yeah, yeah, and how much fiber they own. Yeah. Like Google's probably is is their own, but uh, yeah, yeah, Microsoft maybe not so much, etc. Yeah, uh, but yeah. Um, so in another example, uh, in the one attack, um, the traffic started in Guadalajara, Mexico, and ended up in Washington D.C. <laughs> except for it went through London, Moscow, Minsk, and then Belarus. <laughs> wow. Uh, all because of a fake uh, route injected at Global Crossing, which is a big Tier 1 ISP. Uh, they're now owned by Level 3. Uh, that you know said, hey, for that traffic, bring it over here to Belarus. 
so that somebody can spy on it and then send it back. So it eventually ended up where it was supposed to go. If it just went the really long way around. Long the way, end. yeah. <laughs> or in a second example, a provider in Iceland began announcing routes for 597 different IP networks owned by a large US VoIP provider. Because most VoIP isn't encrypted. Mm. Uh, normally, the Icelandic provider, uh, Open Carify, uh, announces only three IP networks. And all of a sudden, they were announcing 600. <laughs> uh, you know, and the company monitored 17 different events of routing traffic through Iceland uh, mm. when it probably shouldn't have been going through Iceland. It's 17 isn't a huge number. It almost makes it sound like it's... This is 17 separate events. So oh. 17 times it started, and then it was fixed. Could be tons of traffic, though, in that during that yes. time. Yeah. And sense. yeah, this was a whole bunch of IP blocks owned by a VoIP provider. So yeah. somebody could be eavesdropping on calls. Yeah, that makes sense. Hmm. All right. And uh, the company behind it, Renesas, uh, because they're only basically logging trace routes from all their different monitoring points to everywhere else in the world and noting when traffic goes a different direction than usual and stuff, uh, they don't have any information on who may have been hijacking the traffic or what they were doing with it, et cetera. It would just be... Um, You know, they know that it was happening. They don't know why or how or who. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes it could room, be a mistake. Sometimes it could be intentional, right? Uh, someone in the chat room asked, does IPv6 solves these issues? Uh, no. There is a, a thing to solve the issue. It's called, uh, I think, BCP38, uh, Best Common Practices. And it's a list of, of kind of things you should do when you run a BGP router, oh. which includes setting up filtering to not announce any routes that aren't yours. Yeah, but it takes some time to set it up, and then you know if you add a new route, you have to remember to add it to the filter, otherwise, you know, you accidentally <laughs> uh, block yourself. Yeah, right. And you're like, why isn't this working? Uh, and so a lot of places don't implement it. But that is kind of the. But it mostly seems like use a strong password on your router is is the best practice they need to start with. Yeah, and turn off Telnet to the internet, would you please? Yeah. That well, I'm too. pretty sure it's SSH. I don't think well, okay. any big iron still uses yeah. Telnet, but well, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, that, that filtering is probably one of those things that sort of sets the experts aside, apart from the amateurs who maybe... Not really. It's it's not so much that. It's really? it's more that it's just, it's a lot of work to do it, so most places don't. Yeah. Because, um, you know, if we filtered, if, you know, if best practices were actually implemented, uh, IP spoofing wouldn't happen. Like, remember these DNS reflection attacks? Yeah. If every ISP filtered outbound traffic to only allow traffic from their network to leave, so any traffic that was fake coming f uh, and says it was coming from some other network and then leaving through their network would be blocked, and DNS reflection attacks wouldn't be possible. Good point. But nobody implements it because it would be a bunch of work, and they're like, why would we do that? Yeah. Yeah, and they're worried about maybe breaking something, or like you said, somebody implements something. Doesn't well, yeah, or you know, if you're a transit provider, then you need to use you know this list of places you would allow would get really big and hard to manage. And it's like, well, yeah, you know, it's kind of your responsibility not to break the internet. But the other thing is, you know, the BGP trust model is mostly based on only big ISPs are using this, so you know, they're they're not going to do something wrong because then everybody will just disconnect them from the internet. Yeah. <laughs> Right, but we've seen things go wrong. You know, where, um, for example, I think it was uh, some country in the Middle East. I think it was Yemen or something was trying to block YouTube from being accessed in the country. So they made a fake BGP route that would yeah, that know Iran, all the traffic. Right? That was Iran. Um, wasn't it? No, it was somewhere else. Hmm. Might have even been Turkey, actually. Um, and uh, when they they didn't filter it, and so that route that was supposed to just block traffic inside Turkey. Filtered out to the internet and right. blocked most yeah, of the neighboring countries from reaching YouTube as well. In fact, didn't and then it ended up as like this weird. Everybody had like this, some people had this weird YouTube outage and other problems too. I remember that now. It was yep. yeah. There's been a couple of uh, instances of that. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. Wow. Uh, all right. I want any other thoughts on that. Uh, no, that's about for that one. All right. Ah, yes, it was Pakistan, not Turkey. Sorry, I knew Turkey didn't sound right because it's kind of a secular government. But it was Pakistan that Pakistan. accident broke YouTube for a while. Well, give them, give give Turkey give Turkey time. I'm sure eventually. No. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm totally. ah, I just like so, to. Uh, the other. The, so it's the trust model in BGP that's is pretty wide open, and uh, yeah, you know the problem is it, you, they don't, nobody wants to use like SSL on their BGP because the governments have power over all of these um, 
certificate authorities. And so you don't want, you know, this rogue certificate problem to be affecting the routing infrastructure of the internet. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, yeah, you know, my practical experience with BGP in, is more in the LAN aspects of it. And I right. worked... Right, just in like IBGP, right? Internal yeah. BGP. Yeah, and, I, and, and in that, it was always like, um, early on, it was always kind of challenging to have multi-vendor devices. We had HP switches and Dell switches back when Dell... I don't know if they still make switches. Um, and it, we did have... I'm sure switches. they still sell them, but I don't know if they yeah. actually still brand them as Dell. These days, it's not really a problem, but back then, it was still kind of hokey. Uh, but... Uh, you know, it, it's, it makes so, like, what, for example, when it worked properly, we had it set up so that way all these buildings that were connected by wireless links, when one link went down, BGP would end up solving that. Of course, now the people that were in sort of the farther away building would end up having to go through an extra wireless link and slow them down. But the system could automatically reroute around a wireless outage. And that was awesome because we were right next to an airport. So there was constant interference that would just knock wireless out from time to time. Right, and that's well, the whole point of BGP is that, you know, when this piece of fiber over here goes down, we need to find a way around it. Yeah, yeah. Right, or, you know, even uh, when the tsunami hit Japan, was it a year and a half ago or whatever, um, the, you know, a bunch of fiber links got cut, but there were enough left, and BGP just figured it out. Mm-hmm. That's probably the beginning uh, basics of Skynet's neural network. I, I don't know. That's, that's a whole other show. Yeah. <laughs> a little weak, but... <laughs> yeah, well, it's the beginning now. I'm not saying this. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, uh, I want to thank our first sponsor this week, and that is the great folks over at Ting.com. Now, Ting is my mobile service provider because it makes sense. Ting has a lot of fantastic features, no contracts, and thusly no early termination fees. And they also have an amazing bundle of, of, of services that you would generally have to, at least you would expect, have to pay for additionally. I'm thinking things like hotspot, tethering, picture messaging, all of this stuff is included with your Ting service. Also included with the Ting service is the absolutely amazing Ting dashboard. This lets you really take full control of your phone bill, where, 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 what devices you have on your account. You can change things like, I want when somebody rings and I don't answer, I want it to forward to this number. You can do all of that from the Ting dashboard. You can hide your caller ID from others. You can set up call forwarding from the Ting dashboard. You can set caps on different devices individually, so if you don't want some devices to go over a certain amount of minutes or some devices to go over a certain amount of data, or whatever, etc. messages. Ting lets you define all of that, either from their online dashboard, which is awesome, or on their Android app. So as you become a long-term Ting customer, this is one of the things that makes it really nice. However, Ting's also just a great company. In fact, right now you can go over to ting.com slash blog. They're talking about uh, a little uh, give and receive program they're rolling out. I think this is pretty neat. This is kind of nice as the holiday season comes around. Between now and de- December 15th, if you sign up with Ting, first by choosing one of the deserving charities from the list below, after you select your charity, you'll receive a $25 gift that can be applied to select devices, and Ting will match, a, a, a match the first 100 signups with a $25 donation to the charities below that are chosen. I think that's pretty awesome, and it's kind of nice when you're getting yourself something to give a little something as the holiday season comes up. And if you've been considering a Nexus 5, and Alan, I think, you know, I'm not, I'm not pressuring you, but when you're ready to upgrade your next phone, I think you might want to consider the Nexus 5. I think that's looking like a good phone for you. Yep. Yeah. I, I just got to... <laughs> You know, I was just waiting for it to be available over here. I know. It'd be really, really nice if Ting was available over I here. know. I know. In fact, I am. So, what's cool about the way Ting is doing the Nexus 5 is you can buy it directly from the Google Play Store. However, inventory is low right now. So, you, you got to buy it soon. So, mine's right. shipping like on December 3rd, I think. And then you go over there. In fact, Ting has all of this detailed on their blog. They're great about updating their blog with this kind of stuff. You can get it on a SIM priority list. The Nexus 5 uses a new type of SIM. So, you can't oh. just. Well, the fact that it's using a SIM for a CDMA network is kind of. A new thing to begin right, with, but yes. now they're using on top of that a special kind of SIM. Um, but you know, it's this the Nexus Five. What's cool about it is it's got GSM built in, it's got LTE and CDMA built in, HSPA plus all built. It's got all the bands built into the cellular antenna in the phone. So there's just one phone. You don't have to get right, a different instead models. of having the, the two different models they used to have. Right. So that is so when you combine the the awesomeness of just paying a super great low rate directly from the OEM in this case Google Play. And you take it over to the Ting network where there's no contracts, no early termination fee. You only pay for what you use. Oh, and by the way, it's just $6 flat per line. You can have many devices on one plan. They'll all share a pooled set of minutes, and you only pay for what you end up using. 
Ting takes your messages, your megabytes, and they add it all up at the end of the month, and also your minutes, of course. And then they just you just end up paying whatever bucket you fall into. It's really straightforward. And when you combine that awesome dashboard I was telling you about, it makes it really easy to track where you're at all the time, and you have complete control over it. You can go get an idea of what the Ting rates are over on the Ting page. Go over to techsnap.ting.com. That's where you want to start techsnap.ting.com. Why, you say? Why go to techsnap.ting.com? Because they're going to take $25 off your first device. That's right. Or $25 off your first month if you've got a compatible device. They've got all that outlined on their site. I've got my HTC One right here, and I absolutely loves it. Got a great camera. With uh, Android 4.3, the battery life is really solid. Been happy about that. It's nice to also get the updates. And it's just a, it's just a fantastic, wonderful phone. I, I really recommend it, although I think, I think I'll probably say that about the Nexus 5 when I get it. So again, go to techsnap.ting.com, check out that savings calculator. Right now, average Ting bill, I think, is around $33 per month. $33 wow. per month for pay for what you use, smartphone data plan, cellular plan, text messaging, all of it. It's, it's awesome. It's, you can't beat it. It's unbeatable. So go to techsnap.ting.com and go take advantage of the awesome Ting service. And if you really want to get a sense of how Ting is, give them a, give them a call. I think yeah. if you call them, you'll be impressed. one 855 Ting FTW and a real Canadian will answer your phone between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. I think that's pretty neat. And those pe- those people, yep. they're empowered. They're empowered to yes. solve your problem. Right. So, they're not, you know, just let me read script. Uh, like- uh, hello, Mr. Jude. I see you are having phone problems. Have you tried connecting it to iTunes? <laughs> 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 you don't have to worry about that with yeah. Ting. So a big thank yeah. you to Ting for sponsoring the TechSnap program. You guys, go over to techsnap.ting.com and start saving now. Now is better than ever. Get, get yourself a Ting phone. Save some money. All right, Alan. So this next story. Tell me about our next story on as I pull it up here. Okay. Uh, so Cupid Media, which was uh, this oh, yeah. niche dating site uh, in Australia, uh, was hacked and exposed 42 million passwords. That almost sounds a little more than niche when you're talking 42 million. Yeah. <laughs> Although, you know, as with dating sites, there's a lot of signups that just don't go anywhere yeah, and stuff. Yeah, very true. Um, oftentimes, dating sites have um, an affiliate-type program where they pay for every signup, and so there's a lot of fake signups <laughs> and things like that. Yeah, or you, uh, or you sign up, you find your date, and you're good. You don't need to sign up again. Right, or you you sign up and you find it, there's no women on the site, and then you never visit again. (laughs) Yeah, unfortunately, probably very true. Yeah. Okay, so what happened? Uh, But it was found on the same servers uh, that the hackers that amassed the tens of millions of records from Adobe and uh, PR Newswire and the National White Collar Crime Center and all that stuff. Oh, no kidding. So this was yet another cold fusion attack, it would have seen. And this time, plain text passwords. Yeah, so the database had 42 million accounts with their plain text passwords. Ouch. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a common thing with dating sites, especially to use plain text passwords, since um, their whole thing is retention, getting people to come back, keep looking, and hopefully pay for the service. Um, the, so a lot of times they'll do something like send you an, a reminder email every week with you know, your new matches or whatever, and include your plain text password in the email they send you every week. Wow. So you have no excuse not to log in because you don't you can't have forgotten your password because it's right there in every email you get. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, in this case it's it's more uh, a business decision of of driving the site rather than a security decision of let's not do something stupid. Right. With no consideration to the fact that many users use the same password at multiple sites there. Right. They right. just yeah, well, who, yeah, who cares if they log in? It's a dating website. That's probably yeah. the justification. Right. Uh, so Andrew Bolton, the, the company's managing director, said the information appears to be related to a breach that occurred in January. Uh, although, you know, when Krebs searched around the Internet, he couldn't find any information on this breach. And uh, as far as he could tell, no one knew that, there, that this company I, had been hacked I remember hacked in hearing January. about this. We follow this stuff pretty yeah. closely. I didn't, we didn't. Mm-hmm. We would have, I mean, that, I, an account breach that big on the dating site, I probably would have popped up in one of our feeds. What do you think? I mean. So when Krebs told the, the Bolton guy from the Cupid Media that all the Cupid Media users that Krebs had reached out to and asked, you know, is this your password for this dating site? You know, is this data in this file real? Uh, they said that, yes, uh, it was. Uh, so Bolton suggested that Krebs had illegally accessed some of the company's member accounts. Yeah, how about that? I mean, talk about the wrong response right there, right? Yeah. Unbelievable. Uh, uh, Bolton also noted that a large portion of the records located in the affected table relate to old, inactive, or deleted accounts. 
Well, just because the person is not an active user anymore doesn't mean you have the right to just post their data on the internet. Well, and let's unpack that for a second. So what they're saying is, at best, when you deactivate your account, we take all of your data and we move it into an inactive table with your password and plain text. Well, uh, in this case, I think all they did is they have like an active flag that would just set to zero or something. Okay. Uh, so it's not even in a different table. Or like, you know, Adobe was saying, you know, oh, well, there was 138 million records, but only like 40 million of those were active accounts. It's like, so everybody who doesn't have an active account anymore, they just don't deserve any privacy. You, you, you're just not worried about the fact that you leaked all their data. Because like Adobe only contacted the people they considered active. So if your account was not considered active, Adobe didn't even tell you that you had been hacked. Yeah, it's interesting. They say uh, after Krebs was talking with them, Bolton, after several email threads, Bolton adopted a softer tone in the second half of the email, indicating that maybe the company had not fully understood the scope of their original intrusion. Yep. Uh, he says, now, then, then they wrote back saying, now we're in the process. It says, we are currently in the process of double checking all affected accounts and have had their password reset and received an email notification. And they've also hired an external so consultant. Resetting now. the password and then storing it in plain text again. That's helpful. <laughs> Man, I wish there was something we could do about this kind of stuff. It just happens yep. so much. And, and uh, there's there's a website that tracks them called plaintextoffenders.com. Yeah. Uh, we defer to that now rather than trying to list all of them in the Hall of Shame. Right. Yeah. It's just otherwise we'd have the Hall of Shame would be full. <laughs> the hall's only so big, people. Just, right, and so uh, the danger with such a large breach is that so many people reuse the same password at yeah, multiple sites, Yeah, meaning that the compromise of a dating site that nobody cares about could also mean the compromise of email addresses that are then tied to bank accounts and Twitter accounts and, and LinkedIn and stuff, right? That's the thing. They could get right into somebody's Gmail or whatever. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I worry about. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, you, so Facebook is is mining the data from the leaked Adobe accounts and checking those email addresses against all of their users. So if they find a user with the same email address, they then check, uh, even though they're storing the hash password, they can then you know, use the, the salt <laughs> yeah. and hash yeah. the pass, plain text password out of the Adobe database. Well, it's not plain text, but they've all been cracked. Almost all of them have cracked now. Um, Crack that and then compare it. And if the user has the same password on Facebook, Facebook's resetting their password for them. Now, this is kind of an interesting, and they're not, Facebook yeah, isn't the Google only. Google has done this before yeah. with, uh, what was it? One of the, the ones Gawker? that had the AP5 hash. Yeah, Gawker and a couple other ones. Yeah, what do you um, think of this? I think this is cool. I, mean, I think this is a good idea. Yeah, and I was I kind of, at, at one point. Uh, it was like it was a little like creepy at now. first. But. No, but we talked about uh we, I was actually thinking about trying to start like a clearinghouse for this, like a central place where all the leaked passwords would go in a database, yeah. and companies could send uh, somehow anonymized stuff so that they could send their list of users, Okay, and we would send back the passwords to check against kind of thing. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Sounds like a lot of work. Yeah. And... <laughs> You know, it, the hard part would be getting anybody like Facebook to take it seriously enough to start using it. They uh, and also being able to scale it so that when Facebook tried to use it, it didn't just break it. The, uh, Krebs said later in the article, he says, uh, "By my count, more than ten percent of Cupid's users chose one of these passwords. The number one password, kids: one, two, three, four, five, six. One million people. One point nine million people actually." And then one 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 followed by number two, and of course one two three four five six seven eight nine. All kinds of fun stuff about that on the next episode of TechSnap as well, as we play the Adobe Password Crossword game. Oh, fun! <laughs> <laughs> on the next edition of TechSnap, yeah, I love you is pretty popular too. Qwerty. Yep. Now that's just lazy. That's just I love you on a dating site. Like I can see that. I mean that, but Qwerty, come <laughs> on. Oh, it's interesting to see the combinations people come up with as well. Um, you know, in LastPass, I wonder, I don't know how LastPass is doing this, but I've noticed in the last couple of releases of LastPass, um, when I visit a website that I'm using the same password as another site, I'm now getting warnings saying, hey, you've uh -huh. got duplicate passwords here. You should consider creating a new password for this website. And the nice thing is, is if you engage it and you say, yeah, I want to do that, then it's automatically monitoring for you to update your password. So it immediately captures a new password and saves in the LastPass for you. Nice. Uh, so I just have to do my obligatory. I think it's been three episodes if I check the calendar. So now I have to plug LastPass again, because yeah. really, people, when I look at really. this list, I feel like you shouldn't even be allowed to use the internet unless you have a password manager. 
even if it's your own kind, even if it's of your own creation, you just have to like, you, you got to come to me and I'm going to stamp it. And I'm going to say, yes, that, that, that works. You now have an internet license or I'm going to say, no, you need to go back and get a better password manager. I'm not going to say which yep. one. However, if you have LastPass, that probably will streamline your uh, Chris Fisher internet approval process. Yep. And, you know, or you can use KeyPass or one of the other ones like it. And yeah. uh, we were just talking about, uh, I think it was a couple weeks ago, we mentioned, you know, how with KeyPass, since you're storing the, the database is stored locally um, instead of in the cloud, you could use BitTorrent Sync to sync that to all your devices. Yeah. Yep. And, and you know, I, I'm even, even though it's not my favorite, but even platform key man, uh, like, uh, like, you know, some Linux desktop environments or Unix desktop environments offer integrated key wallet, like K Wallet and right. Gnome Key Ring. Uh, Mac OS and iOS now have like this iCloud key ring. Not a huge fan of that, but I'm again, not sure about that one. Like, I, I don't know what how it works yeah. internally enough but to I, say I would that be, I would approve of it. If I if you came to me and said, you know, what's more secure, using the same password everywhere well, yes. or using that, well, I'm going to say, please well, yeah. use that. You know, so yeah. anything really, people just start doing it. And this is just I'm done. I'll get off my soapbox now. Yep. But I feel like we say that all the time, and then we see there this was, kind of stuff. One other interesting thing I noticed in that database on the Krebs site, he had a screenshot redacted yeah. out but of the database, but they, they had the date of birth field. And it was rather than the date field, it was a date time field. And it had all these random times in it. Yeah. I'm not sure what they were for or where they came from. Sign up times? It, in, it was yeah, right there in the birthday the, field. The, the date is part of, is, yeah. is actually people's like birth dates. You can see this like 72 and so on. So it's not, yeah. it's not coming from the, the sign up time then. But in MySQL, if you set a date time field to just a date, the time becomes all zeros. Right. So I don't know where the time was coming from. Because yeah, it, like, it wouldn't really be useful to store the, the, you know, what minute they signed up on in the birth date field. It wouldn't provide anything of use. So I don't know what it is. It was just something strange I noticed. That is, yeah, that is a good catch. Pretty interesting. Look at all those Yahoo email addresses. Wow, those are almost all yeah. Yahoo. There's a little hot mill in there. Holy crap, yeah. that's a lot of Yahoo email addresses. Well, uh, if you're looking at the age of some of those people, when it's 60-something and 70-something, it's the birthday that's, you know, the target audience of Yahoo at the time. I suppose so. But also, they don't have sign-up date in there, but I bet a lot of those sign-ups are quite old. Yeah, very true. Right, but it's, uh, someone in the chat room was like, the time they enter their birth date, but... So the field is storing when your birth date is. So it says, you know, like 1984, blah, 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 blah. And then there's a time as part of that date. So storing what time I signed up, what time of day I signed up, isn't very useful because you don't know what day I signed up. You would use a separate field for that, right? Sign up would be a separate date time. Yeah. So it's just really strange. I yeah, don't you're know right. what they could yeah, possibly right. come with it. Yeah, because if yeah, you, you wouldn't store the time if you're not storing the date. Otherwise, it's pointless. Or if pointless. it's just a random number, so when they sort by birth date it's people are in a random order i don't i have maybe no idea it's what total time course. spent on the site maybe but then what happens when it loops over 24 hours <laughs> i don't know because one of them is like at 23 you don't want to change so. their birthday <laughs> yeah. yeah one of them's at 21 yeah i don't know I, uh, yeah who knows yeah their their birthday increments and uh, <laughs> ars technica has uh, a bunch of extra coverage on the story so if you're interested in more about it you can go look there and since this was in early 2013 if you are a cupid media user i'm sure that's a whole branch of sites um yep. change your password all right alan well good news i want to thank our next sponsor here on the TechSnap program and that is the great folks over at godaddy.com godaddy has been a sponsor of the TechSnap program for a while now and their website builder makes it easy to create your own website put your business online and find new customers choose from hundreds of customizable designs and you're on your way website builder even includes a free domain hosting and 24 7 support domain hosting and support it's go time so go visit godaddy.com enter the promo code wsb7 website builder 7 to get your website builder for one dollar per month so some limitations have to apply when a deal is that good so go over to godaddy's yes. website to check those out and i gotta say when you take hosting you take support and you take the website builder which looks like a really great tool you combine the fact that that spins off a mobile edition and seo friendly goodness I could see this working for anybody who just wants to own their name on the web or own their product or, when, or, or business or whatever it is when somebody searches. You want to be the thing that shows up. It's great for that. If you've got a family member or a friend who needs to throw something online, it's great for that. I went and got my hair cut recently, and the guy asked me two things. He said, what is Ubuntu Linux? Seriously, didn't prompt, I didn't prompt him. And he said, mm. how can I build a website really fast? 
talked about both those things, and I recommend to GoDaddy's website builder because he just needs mm-hmm. to put something up so people can get a map to his place, get his phone number, get his hours, and all that kind of stuff. And he's exactly. got hair to cut. He's got hair to cut, Alan. He's not. He doesn't have right. time to build a website. <laughs> he doesn't have a web designer on staff or anything. Yeah. And when I said, "Do you know what SEO is?" I think he thought I was talking about some sort of psychedelic. I don't think he had any idea what <laughs> SEO was. And you don't have to worry about any of that. Now, if you yeah. do, you know that that kind of stuff is important, and you're thankful that GoDaddy takes care of it for you. So go get set up. Go throw a site online for a dollar per month. See what you can build. Play around with the tools. It's really awesome. Go use the promo code All you WSB7. Have to do is sell one haircut. <laughs> That's true. And you've made your money back. That's true. That's true. WSB7, while you check out, that gets you the website, the builder, and the support for a dollar per month. A big thank you to GoDaddy for the longtime support of the TechSnap program. And a huge thanks to you guys for keeping our sponsors happy. That way they keep coming back to here and keep us on the air. That, my friends, is the circle of podcasting. See how also, that I just noticed yesterday when I bought some a domain, um, the the old coupon code Tech two forty nine to get a dot com for two dollars and forty nine cents still works. Insider tip. Now that's only going to work until the inventory runs out. It's an inventory they're, they're, thing. They're gonna they're gonna notice that 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 one's still out there, and they're gonna shut it down. So if I were you, I would go do it right now. So there you go. That's that's Alan's pro tip. That sounds pro tip. All right, Alan. Well, or maybe I should have kept it secret. If it's inventory based, I should have kept it secret so all my dot coms at least for like another week or something. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, is there anything else we want to cover in the uh, new segment of uh, this year's uh, TechSnap no, program? That's about it. All right, then. That means it's time for the TechSnap feedback. Thanks for sending your emails to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or popping that contact link at the top of the website. Or even better, starting a thread in our subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. And Alan, our first email this week actually comes in from the subreddit, and it was submitted by Ashes. Let's go with that. It says, hi, Chris and Alan and TechSnap Redditors. Smash here. And Okay, Smash, fine. Whatever. He's got two different names. And I'm a sysadmin for a small software company. I'm currently specking out an HP vSphere 5.5 VM host which is a DL160 Generation 8 uh, with a 32 gigs of RAM, an E2620 CPU, 500 gigabyte hard drives, deuce, and my vendor is telling me that I must use HP branded hard drives and not the Western Digital Enterprise drives because they will not work. I've done my research to confirm the drives they want to sell me are just 3.5 SATA drives, which is the same spec as the Western Digital hard drives. Is this 100% ploy to get me to buy more expensive HP hard drives? Or is there actually a real provable technical problem that would prevent me from using these Western Digital hard drives? I totally understand that HP drives are fine, and they're probably even tuned for the HP server, but I just don't need this feature when I plan on booting the OS from a USB flash drive. If I must buy the HP hard drives, I will, but would love some assistance from TechSnop or the crowd. Uh, What do you think, Alan? You buy a lot of drives, man. Generally, it's just that... They haven't tested and verified that those drives work properly with that controller. Mm-hmm. Most drives will work fine. Uh, it'll depend. Are they actually just SATA, not SAS? That was yeah. yeah. A SATA drive is a SATA drive. You don't have to worry there. But if it's a SAS controller or you're going through an expander, then that's when you get difficult. Yeah. Uh, that's why for my server that I bought recently, I actually went against my better judgment almost. or went against the trend I've been using for a long time and bought... Western Digital Enterprise nearline SAS drives, even though they cost more than three times as much as the SATA drives I was going to buy. But in that in this case, it's because they're going through a SAS expander to be able to connect more drives to fewer controllers. And so, you know, it was kind of a requirement. Um, so in general, if they're just SATA drives, then yes, it'll just work. Um, now, if it's if there's a SAS controller and you go into an expander because you have a lot of drives or something, then you generally do want to get at least enterprise SATA drives. Uh, but generally, you want to get SAS drives because um, SATA drives, when they go through a SAS expander, there's this protocol translation and and it, they don't support all the features. And yeah, uh, yeah, for me, the big selling point of the enterprise SAS drives yeah. was that they're dual ported. Uh, so they're actually connected to two different controllers in case one controller fails. That is cool. All the discs stay online. Yeah. I, I gosh, I, if, you know, it's so funny. I'm of two minds of this exact question because this is a question that's come up a lot because there is such a, a huge differential in the price. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've had a lot of HP storage arrays and 
I have always, without without fail, had drives die that were not HP drives in the storage arrays. Now, mm-hmm. I don't know if they, you know, thinking back, they weren't necessarily enterprise-grade drives. The client went out right. and bought some drives and then put them in the HP storage array. And right. I have, but I have always wondered if, if, I would think it depends on the controller you're using. Because I, HP can also, in some cases, replace, replace the actual OEM firmware with, or with their firmware. Like there's an HP firmware right. like, on the drive. You know, Netflix does this. There's a special Netflix firmware that they get from uh, Seagate and uh, Hitachi, I think it is, to uh, put on their drives uh, that makes them act differently because Netflix requirements are different than most people, right? They're more worried about latency than, than certain other features. Big drive vendors like Apple and HP and, and Netflix, like they can work out that kind of arrangement with the hardware vendor. And maybe that makes some kind of difference. If I could, but tra- in general, I'm pretty sure this is just about hardware compatibility list. Yeah, and, I really you know, think it's like they only provide. It. They only provide support for you know making sure your your disk controller is getting optimal performance. Uh, if you use the drives that are on the hardware compatibility list, I would say uh, go go with Alan's advice. If you're gonna if you're gonna not buy their drives, buy enterprise grade drives, right? Don't yeah. that's always been the he, mistake my clients that. made. I think he said that already. Was he was getting the enterprise ones? Yeah, he probably did. Uh, he said, but see. I guess compare the price, and if it's not that much different, maybe go with theirs. But if it is big difference, then sure, you can use other drives. Yeah, I think he is uh, talking if about. So just SATA, drives. you're definitely fine. If they're SAS, then uh, if they recommend SAS and you use SATA, there might be some problems. There. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but SATA is SATA, and you can use whatever drives you want. Yeah. Um, now this is he's, he mentioned it's going to be like a a VMware ESX box, mm-hmm. a vSphere server. Yeah, well, is, does he mean the controller then for vSphere or because I don't know if you're going to vir- do a lot of virtualization, thirty two gigs of RAM doesn't seem like very much. He says a host server. Uh, we have a thirty two gigs of RAM, and well, and, and the other thing that is five hundred gig drive that's not much either. Well, it, mostly it's just not a lot of IOPS. No, like, no, I mean I I would want. Of course, well, he's going to run the Wait, OS from a USB drive, it sounds like. So the right, OS won't so be So all there. the virtual machines are going to run off these two 500-gig drives that I'm guessing he's going to mirror. I, I would definitely want to go with at least RAID 10, having four drives yeah. that you're uh, mirroring, you know, mirroring and striping across two sets of mirrors so that the, uh, you know, you can get a lot of reads and, and some decent write performance when you're reading and writing from this virtual machine. Yeah. Otherwise, the virtual machine is going to be slow. You have, if you have w- even more than a couple virtual machines on that setup and you snapshot one of them, everything's going to come to a grinding halt. I mean, it's going to be horrible. Yeah, yeah that, that is going to be really tight. I well, guess that's something only- in the chat rooms like, why not use one terabyte drives? I would say I'd rather have four 500 gig drives in RAID 10 than oh, yeah. have the, the pair of one terabyte drives mirrored. Because, you know, if you're all about, if, if you need the performance, you're better off with more disks uh, so you have more spindles. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, very good. All right, our next email comes in from Jerry, and he says, Hi, Alan and Chris. Love the show and the beard. Thank you. He likes your beard too, Alan. Uh, he says, right. Keep up the good work. I think he means about the beards. I'm a Gmail user. Like many, I'm uncomfortable using the service from a company that puts scanning users' emails to generate advertising revenue, NSA whims, media company bullying, and indeed almost anything or anyone in front of its own users' privacy. Not to mention constantly having G+, take over and ruin several Google services. Talk, YouTube, how long will it be before they ruin Gmail? I want my lesson. I want to lessen my dependence on Google where possible, especially where my emails are concerned. One possibility is self-hosting. For a long time, I assumed this was a difficult process and would simply not be reliable enough for important email accounts. I recently read an article that put a much more positive spin on cutting out the middleman and going it alone. It never sounds like a genuinely realistic proposition for the fairly tech-savvy user, however. What's that? It now sounds like a genuinely realistic endeavor. Do you have any advice or any of your own experiences to share with going down the self-hosting route? Uh, I'm on a very tight budget and currently have just one low-power dedicated server... And he says he's not really in a position to upgrade it. My concern with using this server is that there's only a single hard drive. If it decides to fail, then suddenly not only is this my email hosting down, but all those emails could be lost. Hosting from home is not an option for me either. Alternatively, there's an option of simply finding a new company to host my email on my behalf. Are there any free or reasonably cheap email hosts that, similar to the old free Google apps, that can be trusted not to be involved with the NSA? Can, one, any, can anyone trust them now? Don's a tinfoil hat. All the best. Jerry. Um, so self-hosting is definitely an option. Uh, you can use a cheap VPS or whatever. Um, 
there's a couple of things. A, yes, you're going to need a backup scheme of some kind to make sure that you don't lose your mailbox. Uh, at Scale Engine, uh, we have all our email on one server, and then it's actually in a jail. And that entire ZFS data set gets replicated every 10 minutes to a backup server in a different data center. Uh, mostly so that if that server were to go down, uh, we could turn on the one at the other data center to take over mm-hmm. doing email. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, because we send all our email via that server, because all of our email is also uh, signed with domain keys. Um, and it's also where we host our um, help desk app and database. Um, separate from that, you have your backup mail servers or backup MX. And what those do is, you know, people send an email to you, they try to deliver it to your main mail server, right? The one that you're hosting. If that's down, uh, then they end up either sometimes they'll retry, but a lot of times they won't, and, or, you know, they'll retry a lot later. So with a backup MX service, uh, the one I used to use until I had a lot of my own mail servers was um, uh, dnsmadeeasy.com. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's great. One. And basically they would buffer up your emails, and then when your mail servers back up, they'll send them. Uh, so they, they accept the mail on your behalf, hold it until your mail servers back up, and then deliver it to you. Mail route's similar to that, and that's one I've used yep. before. And the other nice thing is um, you can also send through them. So you can send and receive through them. And they're totally legit. Like they're not on spam lists, right? They're they're constantly right. monitoring that kind of thing. So they solve one of the problems you can run into with self-hosting is all of a sudden the the list that AOL or Google or Yahoo subscribe to somehow your IP block, your whole range yes, ends up on that ISP list. or something yeah. is on the list. Too. Yeah. Whereas if you're going through mail route, they're kind of a known good quantity and they've kind of set up relationships and they let you like Alan said, store them forward, but they also remove spam and they really need to advertise on this show. Uh so um you know, the chat room's got a few suggestions, like uh, get a GoDaddy server, uh, do a DreamHost or a DigitalOcean um, uh, uh, VPS. Well, well, yeah, if it's a VPS, then you have a bit more control. Uh, yeah. But yeah. regular shared hosting, you know, your email's just with everybody else's. Uh, so, you know, if you're really paranoid, then um, you could do two VPSs, right, instead of a dedicated server or something. Uh, it depends on what you can afford. You know, if you have a dedicated server, you can usually rent a VPS quite cheap that you could use just to store backups. Right, it doesn't need a lot of RAM if it's just going to be storing backups. I mean, the reality is though is this is why so many people are using uh, hosted mail solutions is they handle a lot of these little things for you. They yep. handle the infrastructure for you, and they stay online. Yep. Um, the other one that uh, a friend of mine, uh, Dan Langill, that runs BSD Can, the way he set up his backup solution is he set up uh, Proc Mail so that ev- uh, on his mail server every time he gets an email it actually forwards it to his backup server, which then stores it in an inbox in his second account. And then he uses the log rotate system to rotate the inbox file once a week. Yeah. That's and clever. So That's really straightforward, too. If, so if he loses the whole server, he, he's got back to the backups of his mail dir off his main mail server. Okay. But to cover the time between the last Bacula backup and... The um, when the server went down, right? So if he backs up with Bacula once a night, to cover the time between the last backup and when the server went down, he goes to the forwarded copies of the emails uh, on his other server. What about what about just staying on Gmail and just encrypting everything? You know, point Thunderbird at it and install the Thunderbird uh, GPG uh, tools, which are awesome and amazing. That would require people that send you the emails to encrypt them. Yeah, right? yeah. You I don't encrypt. Mean- I know. So, but if, you're, you're not, if there's you're a not few going select get, people, right? But the email you get from PayPal isn't ever going to be encrypted. Right. Yeah. It's the sad part. Yeah. Or and all the email password Which resets. PayPal would offer that. The password reset emails will always be decrypted yeah. and all that kind of stuff. But you think some service would offer that where you could just give them your GPG fingerprint and they would send you all your email encrypted? Really? Uh, yeah. In fact, I there was one I'd used. What service? I can't remember. There was a site that that offered that functionality. I, I can understand that you know you would get semi-competent people that would start using it and then forget their password and then not be able to decrypt. They would lose their key and not be able to decrypt the password reset emails. Yeah. Because, you know, uh, people often reformat their machine uh, yeah. and then realize, oh, there was that GPG key I used occasionally and I've lost it. Guilty. Yeah. Did that years ago. I mean, I've learned my lessons now, but that's how I lost my first right. couple of... <laughs> You lost your Mumble certificate recently, though. Yeah, I did. Well, yeah, that's just different computer, not that's a reinstall. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
and things like that. I have too many uh, computers, Alan. <laughs> yes. That's why you need a proper key store. You're right. I need one. Alan, you probably need a real hardware security module. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so email is, is definitely complicated. Yeah. Um, it's something I'm still trying to figure out how I want to handle it. I have a Gmail that I use for mostly just show stuff. Uh, I don't use it for much. Uh, and then, yeah, most of my email is, is on a private, uh, a pair of private mail servers. I, I kind of. I have one for more personal email and one for the business mail. I feel like I can't accept. I mean, so uh, like DigitalOcean, disclaimer, sponsor on Unplugged and Coda Radio. But yep. their low end box is plenty for running an email server, and it's $5 a month. Yep. You get a terabyte so of transfer. It's also just great, uh, you know, if you have a server already and like it, that's fine. That's a good five dollars for a backup is not bad. No, yeah, that's a good point. You could just use it for that too. I think, but with the combinations of services like Easy DNS Made Easy and Mail Route, I think those things lessen the downtime concern. So that solves that problem for him. And then it's really he just needs to find an economical way to host it himself. I really, I mean, for me, the solution I'm really thinking of is VPS and Zimbra, and just because I like I like everything the Google Apps offer: the calendaring, the the contacts, the shared notes task list and the, the company directory for shared contacts between uh, uh, company members and then syncing right. to an Android device. Zimbra offers all of that on a system you run. It's kind of compelling. So that's what I'm considering yep. doing, but you know, I'm still kind of like just testing it out. All right. Well, our next email, good news, ZFS question, comes in from Benny. He says, hi, guys. My name is Benny, and I'm a sysadmin from Israel. I love your show, and I'm plugged in last, and I listen to them almost daily. I know that you guys over at – I know that the guys over at ZFS on Linux claim that it is production ready. But is it really? Would you use it for, for production servers on production environments the same as you would use, say, Oracle's Sun Storage? Thanks for clearing it up for me. So, Alan, the question really is – ZFS on Linux, would you actually put in production? Um, so, ZFS on Linux is a, a real port of real ZFS. Um, so, the ZFS code is actually identical, like copy pasted. Uh, however, the code that integrates it into Linux is new ish. And, and it, um, is, it a, is it like an add on component? I mean, it doesn't ship with the Linux well, kernel. Uh, Right, yeah, th that's part of it, but uh, I don't actually know what it takes to actually get ZFS on Linux working. Uh, but basically, Linux has its own version of the the ZFS POSIX layer, or, or ZPL. And this is, you know, FreeBSD has its own version, too, because our VFS layer is completely different than the, the Lumos one. Um, so I've never done it. I don't know for sure, but... Um, the, the main driving force behind the ZFS on Linux project is the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories, and they use it in production. Although they're mostly doing research and it's not as big a deal necessarily, or basically they have enough hardware that actually have backups in case something does go wrong. And so, you know, so should you. <laughs> um, That's true, right? I mean, if you got backups, and if it's in production, well, you really should have backups. Uh, the, because they're a laboratory, a little bit of downtime isn't necessarily uh, the end of the world for them. Doesn't cost them millions. They have the backups, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it, you know, if it takes a couple hours to restore something or whatever, that's fine. But so ZFS on Linux uses the Solaris porting layer. It is a Linux kernel module which provides many of the Solaris kernel APIs. Right. Kernel modules are tied to specific versions of the kernel, so you could run into a potential issue if you have a kernel update which can happen on a Linux box. Um, so you can, you'd, have to be, you'd want to make sure you're using a distro that will drag that module along with it when it does the update. Otherwise, you could not access your file systems after a kernel update. But, you know, I've heard from an S-ton of people that are running this production because every time somebody asks us this question, my answer is, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. Right. I would run just FreeBSD. However, every time I say that, I hear from a few people who are like, dude, I've got terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data in production. Yeah, there are lots of people doing it, uh, so... You can be reasonably safe. I think, I think it is. I mean, the fact that it's copy and paste actual code, it's using this uh, Solaris kernel API module, which is probably the only sticking point, but it's not like it's going, it's not like it's, it's not like it's Fuse, which is what I thought it was before. Right. And that's where I kind of... Well, there was, there was a version that yes, was Fuse. That right. was the first one. That's, that's where my confusion came from. not been maintained in a long time. And Fuse runs totally in user space. And at that point, not, not that I've actually ever had not any problems with it. Not on FreeBSD anymore. 
Oh, really? In FreeBSD 10, uh, we have Fuse built into the kernels so that it's actually not crap. Snaps. I've never actually had any problem with Fuse at all. In fact, I've used it quite a bit like for network file transfer well, stuff. But... I used the space one. Uh, it was a bit of a pain. And basically, there were always problems with the kernel module in FreeBSD because every time you upgraded the kernel, you needed to recompile the kernel module. Which could happen with this Sun port. I mean, I don't know. It depends yeah, on the distro. Like, yeah. yeah. Uh, but you know what? I kind of almost think it might be time. I think maybe it's here. Um, you know, if you have a very compelling reason not to use FreeBSD, you right. could use Linux. Right, that would be my point. It's like if there's an application use driving the, the, the use of Linux, then do it. But if there's no application demanding the use of Linux, then why not just hedge your bets and use FreeBSD? Because you can still use Samba, you can still use NFS, SSH, you can still get to the file system the same way over the network. So, And it's a better NFS server. <laughs> oh, snaps. Uh, but anyway... Uh, so yes, uh, there are people doing it in production. So yeah. if all that is that, if that was all you're looking for, is that I'm not going to be the only guy making this mistake, then you're covered. Yeah, and you know what the chairman's pointing out, good point is that you have technologies like DKMS under Linux, which will automatically rebuild the kernel modules when you get a kernel update. That's what I use on my Arch boxes to do things like my uh, ZBox, my VBox modules, and stuff like that for VirtualBox. So that totally works. All right, Ground Zero writes in, Hi, Chris and Alan. Loving the shows. I started it with Lass, and now I watch both TechSnap and BSD Now every single week. I actually met the BSD crew at via VBSD Con. It's this cool oh, conference. Cool. Yeah. Did you remember Ground Zero, Alan? Did you? <laughs> I'm sure that wasn't his actual name. Uh, he says, yeah. You guys are talking about the proper way to write emails and mention that those legal disclaimers in the email don't do anything and don't hold up in court. This may or may not be true. Uh, he goes on to say, uh, but government clients require any email that comes from them contain one of these disclaimers. Even as a contractor, I'm forced to add the legal block to my email that I send to anyone who has a particular domain in their email address. Just thought this might offer some insight. I don't think anyone really wants to have two paragraphs at the bottom of every email. <laughs> yeah, we were poking fun. And I yeah. actually worked at a, at a place that at the server side would inject that signature. And it was like a big deal. We had to get that all set up because not enough users were adding the adding it to their to their signature in Outlook. So Chris had to set it up at the server side, and I just remember rolling my eyes. Uh, and I actually think these have been challenged in court and failed to hold up. Right, uh, but you know, a government policies mandate you do all kinds of ridiculous things. Dude, if I had a client tell me I had to have that in my signature, I'd do it. I mean, well, yeah, you know, dude, it's you not a big, it's not a big deal, uh, but it's just kind of silly. Yeah, it's uh, our main point was please don't have that when you send it to the mailing list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And remember, you guys, the internet is a series of tubes, and if you clog it up when you make your emails too long, it's not a truck. You can't just load anything onto it. Got to be careful. <laughs> All right, Helen. Well, truck that overflows too. Just so you know, <laughs> that's a good point. That analogy actually is pretty weak. Uh, well, rest rest in peace, Mr. It. Stevens. So, uh, in general, I would say that, you know, if you have to, you have to, but hopefully these will fall out of favor. I think part of it is, you know, they're just going for the shock value. The, you know, you're not going to forward this email if you see that, hopefully. You know what I think or it is, too? you're not going to, or, you know, if you post it verbatim somewhere, it's going to include this disclaimer where you're saying, I wasn't supposed to post this. It, to me, it seems like a company wants to be able to give the phone to their lawyer and have them call up and talk to didn't you see that disclaimer we put at the bottom of the email? That was not supposed to be forwarded. And, like, the lawyer can be, all like, Mr. Bad Guy and, and scare right. them, you know. But I don't know if they actually took it to court. Who knows how far it would get. Maybe, right. maybe you know, you never know. A different court case could go a different way, too. Uh, yeah. I mean, I first started seeing it. Um, well, like, I'm, I'm sure with that, you couldn't hit the... Yeah, I don't know. It's mm. just all silly. What's so funny, too, is, like, the e the signatures that say... This email is for the attendant addressed, and if you receive this email in mistake, but you you know you sh don't read it and delete it immediately is what the signature says. But it's at the bottom well, of the email. Usually, <laughs> it also asks you to notify the person who sent it to you, yeah. so they know they did it wrong. But then, but how can I even read that if I'm not supposed to be reading the email? Yeah, <laughs> and it's like, how about you just don't send me emails I wasn't supposed to get? Am I the only person that just wants? I don't. I don't just kind of want email to die. I want it to die in a fire. Like I want email to like suffer as it dies that's all i'm asking for as i'd like to get rid of email so hard and just move to a whole nother system if you had a system with proper signing and keys and all this garbage would would really kind of just be taken care of because the system well, we itself have a lot of, like like you know at scale we use domain keys so every email that actually comes from us is signed 
uh, with a key, and the public side of that key is published in DNS, well, so you can check and make. I mean, that's the right way to do yeah, it. I'm hundred percent sure that email actually came from us. Yeah, I like that, but people don't do that. Yeah, but uh, there are some problems. But you know, if you're an ISP, you know, if you're talking about your at Comcast address, you know, if you send it from if you use the Gmail to send the email, but from your Comcast address, then Gmail doesn't have the key to sign that. Yeah, that's true. That's so basically, it imposes some usability stuff. It's like you have to connect to the right mail server to send your mail, so it actually gets signed. Scott, Scott but that's also the, uh, the whole point. The whole point is that you know, there's only certain places email from this domain should ever actually originate from. Scott, where's in the chat room is uh, linking us the email signature legal requirements in the UK. If your business is a private limited company or a public limited company or a limited liability partnership, the Companies Act of 1985 requires your letterhead order forms and business emails include the following details. Company name, registration number, your place of registration like Scotland or England or Wales, and your registration office. In every email? Give me a break. Nobody does that. It just goes in the footer. Well, it's because they treat email as if it was like an old-fashioned letter. Yeah, and they give an example of how you put it in the footer. You know, having that in the signature isn't all that abnormal. No, I actually like mine like, has my company name, my position, my phone number. That's how I find people's phone numbers. I don't keep an active address book. I just go search my inbox. It's a database. That's where I pull information. I mean, I get right. that. So that's okay. You know, having the company's registration number and an address isn't that much of a pain. But no, but the other stuff is a little wonky. Uh, very good. Well, there you go. If you'd like to get a hold of the TechNet program, just go over to JupiterBroadcasting.com and click that contact link at the top of our site, and then choose TechNet from the drop down, or start a thread in our subreddit links.techsnap.tv. But Alan, with the feedback all done, that means it's time for the Tech Snap Roundup. Welcome to the Tech Snap Roundup. Yeah, that's what that crazy music means. Now, the Roundup are stories that didn't quite fit at the top of the show, but we still want to talk about them, give you some links to follow up on your own after the show. And a lot of these links come from our subreddit over at links.techsnap.tv. And Mr. Jude, the uh, first Roundup story this week, I believe, is mine. And yep. it's creepy. It's really creepy. Uh, so LG has been caught logging USB device names and the file names on those USB devices. When you plug them into your smart TV, it submits them to the LG servers, transmits. It does a little index of the drive, sends them all the file names. And uh, this guy was digging through. This option is turned on by default. It looks like there is an option to turn it off. But uh, he started plugging in and then running uh, Wireshark to get a packet capture of uh, what the heck they were sending. And so they're submitting it not encrypted. Right. Oh, yeah. It's Clear text. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, clear text. Yep, yep. Why does their HTTP endpoint not have SSL? Come on. Uh, he says, uh, you can clearly see a unique device ID is transmitted along with the channel name currently being watched and a unique device ID uh, and then, of course, any file name. So they're watching what you watch and they're tying it to each device and then they give it, they assign a unique ID to each USB device you insert too. Right. Pretty creepy. Now, you can turn it off, it looks like. It has like. the list of file names that were on your USB. Yeah. You know, there'd be some interesting statistics to see there. Like, I wonder how many are people say, using, how many people do slideshows of JPEGs off a USB stick versus how many people watch uh, recorded video and, and how many know, of those what's files? What's the most popular? Yeah. How many of those are downloaded and what's the yeah. most popular thing that's been watched? How many ever? of those are .mkvs with uh, HD RIP in the file name? Uh, I think right. that is what I, I mean, no way that they would just be using this to collect that and then, like, I mean, what if, like, could somebody I'm come guessing to... I they're just looking at what people are using the most of so that they can, you know, make the next version of TV be better at that. I guess but. so, because if you can get the file extension, that's almost all you really need if yeah. you're just doing that. Now, listing everyone that's on the USB stick rather than what was actually watched is interesting. Maybe they probably list that, too, so that, like, they know what was on the stick that you didn't look at. And I guess they even had an ad promoting like data collection features, but uh, since the story broke, they've removed it off of their website. <laughs> but really, the most egregious thing here is that they didn't use HTTPS. I agree, yeah. If they had, people probably wouldn't have figured out that they were spying on them. Yeah, that's true too. You know, they would, oh, there's an encrypted connection going back, but we have no idea what's in it. Hmm. I think this is kind of creepy. I hate the idea that these, as these devices get more sophisticated, we have to start worrying about this kind of stuff. Maybe we just shouldn't worry. I don't know. I kind of yeah, worry. Uh, I would be interested to see what stats they had collected. You know, it'd be you know, interesting to know what they're actually using it for. But I'm just wondering what's the most pop- ten most popular files that have been watched off a USB stick. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I bet they. Uh, I bet 
I bet they do. They must collect that. And you could, I bet during like peak uh, seasons of like um, Game of Thrones and stuff like that, <laughs> I bet you the stats go heavy in one direction. Uh, yeah. All right. The next story on the roundup, some vendors just can't seem to sell OpenStack to enterprises, Alan. What's going on? Yeah. Uh, so Gartner, which is a consulting firm, uh, they're in marketing and stuff, uh, went to the OpenStack conference, which I think was in Hong Kong. Uh, and, you know, his conclusion was, I now understand why people are having trouble selling OpenStack for private clouds. You know, on OpenStack's website, they have this list of, of companies that have successfully used OpenStack, but it's places like PayPal and not, you know, a regular big bank or an insurance company or a healthcare provider or anybody uh, where, you know, they might make sense to have a, a uh, instead of using something like Amazon where they'd have their own private cloud, right? Because, you know, if you have uh, banking or healthcare data, you don't want to give that over to anybody. But his main point is just a lack of clarity about what, what OpenStack actually does and what it doesn't do. Everybody loves to claim their product does everything under the sun. Yeah. There are certain things OpenStack doesn't actually do. And there are like missing features and stuff. And, and when nobody can articulate that. Nobody's like, well, I don't know if that can actually do what I'm looking to do. Uh, also, the, the lack of transparency about the business model around OpenStack. Right, like some vendors can benefit from OpenStax complexity by selling professional services, whereas some vendors can benefit from OpenStax lack of enterprise-grade functionalities to augment OpenStack with their own management system. Uh, but then someday, what if OpenStack grows these management systems as for free, right? Mm-hmm. And so you don't want to build your business on doing this add-on to OpenStack if OpenStack is then going to eat your lunch, right? And things like that. a lack of vision and long term determination. Uh, hmm. What what is um, OpenStack going to do that VMware doesn't? Mm-hmm. And things like that, right? Yeah, it's definitely much more nebulous to explain to people too. So I could yeah. see that. Uh, hmm. Yeah, it says when uh, large enterprises decide to build a private cloud, they commit to a long and complex, multi year, often often multi million dollar implementation. So you know where's it going to be in five years is extremely relevant. Yeah, and who's going to, you know, support it five years? Like, you know, if it's a five-year contract, who's going to support it three years from now and stuff, right? Whereas, you know, with VMware, you know that they're going to be there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Uh, but like, mostly, it's like, have you tried to install OpenStack? <laughs> Seems pretty ridiculous. The thing is, is it's not like VMware is should really be up on some sort of pedestal. I mean, they flip-flop right. around on their licensing models. Yeah. They flip-flop yeah. around on what different versions can do what. And they're kind of the they're kind of the definition of vendor lock-in in some cases. Yep. Especially sure. when you start relying on their management tools. I so you know, there's yeah, VMware will be around. That's for sure. But it's tough to say. Well, yeah, basically, OpenStack is this kind of giant. It's turning this giant thing where there's like all these companies in there adding like tuning knobs and stuff yeah or are pushing it but it seems like it's not actually a finished product <laughs> yeah that's exactly and, how and, it. and nobody has a clear goal on how to make it a finished product yeah well there a lot of there's a lot of chefs in the kitchen yeah and but and nothing's actually getting cooked they're all just <laughs> just <laughs> they're all just ordering takeout at the end to, of the day <laughs> yeah <laughs> fighting over who gets to wield the knife yeah um you know uh, we can't have an episode these days without mentioning CryptoLocker or something like it. I'm not quite sure. Yep. Uh, Massachusetts Police Department pays 750 bone ransom to open computer files locked by hackers, and the payment was made in Bitcoin. <laughs> so there you go. This sounds like CryptoLocker to me. Uh, yeah, yep. the virus called CryptoLocker has been attacking computers since September, early October. An expert told the Boston Globe. So there you go. They, the police department ended up getting stung by it, according to Lieutenant Gregory Ryan. Uh, he said a window popped up on the screen saying all the computer's files were encrypted on November 6th after opening an email attachment from what looked like a trusted source. <laughs> what? Uh, uh. <laughs> I don't... I, mean, uh, it can't. It, I, I didn't almost get caught or anything, but it was really annoying yesterday when I got an email from FedEx. after like, They phoned up. And we talked, and they were emailing me a document I had to sign to import a very expensive server across the border. And with beside their email was a phishing email, also claiming to be from from FedEx. Oh, no kidding! Well, I get like three of those a week. 
I'm like, I'm used to seeing them, right? And, okay, and good. I could tell the difference because the fake one was like in a dot zip. Oh, yeah, stuff. okay. And, you know, the FedEx one was obviously real, whereas the, the one that wasn't was horribly fake. But it's like they're just happened to be right side by side in my inbox, and I was laughing at it. Yeah, you just I I laugh because there's like what what can you expect average users to do? I mean, this yeah. is just the kind of problem that just keeps on being a problem. Like it, if, since email and attachments were a thing, we've had this problem, and we are multi years into it now, and we are no sign away from getting away from this problem. It just yep. there, again, there's email. a reason for a while that. Um, Exchange server just removed all attachments for everything. Well, maybe that's just the thing. Like, there's so many file sharing services, and there's a lot of uh, file right, sharing services people, that are you know, corporate. How friendly. many phishing? How how many phishing services also just include a link and people click it? True, true. So it doesn't have to be an attachment for yeah. people to be dumb enough to download it and open it. In fact, yeah. And you know, totally. technically, your browser maybe has more yeah. Yeah. chance of also having a zero day, especially if they're using IE. So, which they probably are. So you're right. So here's what we need to do. We need to kill email in a fire. That's all I'm saying. Just got to kill email in a fire. All right. Well, uh, our next story is about this uh, Alan Juke guy, and he was uh, visiting uh, the BSD talk show, episode 235. He chatted with uh, the host there about uh, VBSD Con, Scale Engine, TechSnap. Uh, So it's a 26-minute interview with me, uh, and we talk a tiny bit about TechSnap and uh, BSD Now, but mostly about Scale Engine and how that works. Oh, I bet there's got to be some people out there that are interested in that. BSD yeah. Talk, uh, we'll have it linked in the show notes, or you can go to bsdtalk.blogspot.ca. Get that. Uh, yeah. uh, the official, the original BSD Talk. Yeah, I was going to say. And also a Canadian, huh? No. What's .ca? Oh, that's probably because I... Oh, they just to... probably just read yeah, it. Yeah, Google okay. Yeah, yeah. It. yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. So uh, we'll have a link to that in the show notes, and why not go look at the Canadian version? Give, uh, give that some hits. Uh, all right, next story on the uh, roundup, a little meter that shows the big differences in charging plugs and cables, which is great because we were just having a pre-show chat about this. Um, this one's yours, Alan. No, it's not. It's not? Oh, I put this in there? <laughs> no. No, I oh, did, but okay. I put it in for you to read because right, well, I already had too many. So I've, uh, I've personally noticed this one, but you know, people might not be aware that not all USB ports are the same. In fact, some have different yeah. voltage levels, and there really hasn't been a way to tell unless you happen to just know the specs of the... Of the device, well, right? Actually, on my laptop, the, the, there are three different colors for the ports. The blue ones are USB 3. Yep. The black ones are regular. Yep. And then there's one that's yellow that stays on even when the laptop is powered off. Ah. Uh, which is what you would use to charge if you were in a, you know, particularly, if you really needed it. Right? This, though, okay, so what they have is it's called the, pract- uh, it's called the practical meter. And you hook it up to your USB port, and then it has little LED lights on it that indicate the amount of power that that port can provide. And mm-hmm. see, like, when, when you're charging your smartphone, the more power it provides, the faster your smartphone charges. And today, yeah. I was plugging, before the show, I plugged my HTC One into my Bonobo. So my, the way my Bonobo works is the ports are full power when it's awake, and they go into low power when it's asleep. They're all active, but they're all just low power, so it charges a little slower. Um, could also might have also been because I wasn't plugged in. So the phone come, it came up with a warning that says, beep, beep, warning, you'll be charging very slowly from this plug. You know, to get to get a faster charge, plug into a higher power source. Um, yeah. And this right here uh, it would be like so if you have a, if you have like a tablet, like especially the iPad, which requires like ten volts or something like that, uh, and you notice it's just taking forever to charge, you can plug this into the USB port, and it'll give you an accurate readout of how much power you should be getting from that port. Super cool. Can I order this from Amazon? I kind of want that. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm gonna... uh, but yeah, they show a bunch of pictures of a, you know plugging it into the side of the laptop, and you know it's only got one red light. Yeah. You know? womp, womp. But if you start, if you power the laptop up, all of a sudden it's getting two bars. Uh, if you charge your phone off of it, then it's using three bars. But if you charge your phone directly out of the wall socket, you get five bars, and so on and so on. Uh, so I'm searching for practical meter on Amazon. It's coming up in the auto. <gasps> they do have it. Look at that with Apparently a fast charge cable. Like, it's twenty five dollars with the fast charge cable. Yeah, so they've got they've got a couple of different options. Wow, they've even got one that has a digital display of the of the voltage. Oh, that's kind of cool. But I want that just because I'm geeky. I know. So yeah, so the but the one that's got the LED lights also comes with a one USB cord that has all the different USB tips on it, including oh. uh, the uh, 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 iPhone old the thirty pin iPhone port, uh, micro <laughs> and mini. That's kind of okay. Neat. So uh, this was originally a Kickstarter. 
and their goal was to get $9,999, right? So $10,000. They managed to raise $167,000. This is a problem people have. This is an ongoing problem, Alan. Well, I'm, gonna, I'm thinking, I'm what, thinking they, I'm get what, would, what could they do with the extra money? It doesn't even make any sense. Maybe use, I don't know, higher build quality? You know, what? I'm going to put one on my dad's birthday list too. Dad, don't watch this because this is going yeah. on your birthday. Well, list. I guess I guess uh, most of it was if you paid so much, you got one, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. if you paid nineteen dollars or more, you actually got sent one. Yeah. So, so you kind I of buy that. Most of the time. money went to 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 actually buy. Okay, that makes more sense. That does. Yeah, that is kind of cool. All right, I'm going to get one for me, and then I'm going to put one on my dad's Christmas list. I think that's super cool. So uh, there you go. That's the practical meter, and you plug it into your USB port, and it gives you USB uh, port. <laughs> you like that? Oh yeah, there's a picture of it with the, with the oh you can actually charge multiple devices at once too. You can each you, use yeah, each one of the connectors. Yeah, it's got the spider cable. That is so cool. Yeah, because they show it here actually with using a, a solar panel. Yeah. Oh and my using... gosh, this is really neat. This is this is really cool. Okay, so they, here's a picture of it charging the HTC One. Uh, ah, and they actually have an explanation of what the bars means. So one bar means an iPhone would take eight hours to charge. Two bars is six hours, three bars is four hours, four bars is two hours, and five bars is 1.5 hours. And it's interesting because you can see it gets different performance when you plug it into like the official AC adapter. It's full bars, ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll put a, you know what, I'll, you know what, I'll put a link to that in the show notes too if you guys want the practical meter. That is yes. pretty cool. Okay. Did um, you affiliate have I, I is it? The, uh, the uh, ubiquity, what, what is this? Ubiquity eyes turning Sears auto centers into data centers. Oh. Yes. So Ubiquity Critical Environments, uh, which is not to be confused with Ubiquity Servers, uh, is teaming up with Sears, uh, who owns all this real estate for all these auto centers that they're not making any money off of. Yeah. Uh, so they're going to turn them into data centers. Smart. That and so, so these would mostly be in off markets. So, you know, there's plenty of places. There's a bunch of places where there's a lot of data centers, like, you know, Chicago and Phoenix and Los Angeles. Uh, but there's not that many data centers you know, in Buffalo or, 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 I don't know, some other weird places where there's not as many data centers. Right. Uh, and this basically would take existing real estate that's already there. Uh, the, the reason they're using the auto centers is because they're usually giant square building, like, you know, giant buildings with 16-foot ceilings and there's no partition walls they have to tear down or anything. So they just build up a raised floor and... Kind of, they can deploy modular data centers inside these giant cavernous buildings. We are living in the new modern times. That's incredible. Well, the data center we're in, in Toronto originally was a trucking warehouse. Huh. So they just sealed up the doors along the most of the loading bays. They kept two for offloading equipment. Uh, they sealed up the rest of the doors, built the raised floor inside the giant cavernous empty building. Uh, and the, the big thing about that site where ours is, is that there was an on-site well. And so they, they use chilled water cooling by just pumping the water out of the ground and then putting it back. That actually makes a lot of sense. Just it's, um, it's a sign of the times in a way. But, uh, you know, you look at it too. Like I'm picturing like the typical Sears store where they'd have like the store area in the front and then that whole back area is just ripe for the picking. You could convert the front There's area to some of those, office. but uh, a lot of the ones, the, um, the auto center was completely separate and like the opposite side of the parking lot from the mall part. Huh. So it would be a completely isolated building. Yeah. But either way, yeah, there's like everywhere there's a Sears Auto Center could soon be a data center. And then you have parking spots available uh, for staff, but you still then, yep. you don't need all the parking spots, so you can install generators. So you got, you got cement t- room for a generator, for multiple yep. generators. I mean, this is, it's actually brilliant, really. It's kind of, it's kind of brilliant. Uh, all right, anything else in the roundup? Is that it, right? That brings yep. us to the end? Uh, yeah, that's the end. Okay. Um, but right. I'm looking forward to this. It might be easier for Scaling to get servers in a bunch of, uh, you know, less popular places. Yeah. Yeah. And it, well, and if you get more st- more data centers, then the cost, again, those data centers should go down. Too. Right. Yes. Uh, hopefully, also, this floods the market and makes yeah. data center space really cheap. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. Cool. All right. Well, links to everything we talked about can be found in this week's episode of the show notes. Just go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com. Look for episode 137 of the TechSnap program. You can also get a hold of us. You can pop that contact link at the top of the Jupiter Broadcasting website. And even better, we won't be here live next week because uh, we're taking the day off for the Thanksgiving here in the States. Yep. But we generally are live at 1 p.m. Pacific over at jblive.tv, which is... 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Boom. Also over at jblive.info for the audio-only stream. And we have 
high bit rate if you're sitting at your desk, which is like 128 kilobits, and we have low bit rate, which is like 56 kilobits, which is good if you're on a 3G, 4G connection and you're driving around. Just go to jblive.info to get those. And uh, you can also grab a BitTorrent version of this show to help us defer the bandwidth cost, and you can subscribe to the RSS feeds to get it automatically every single week. How about that? It's like internet magic. We just deliver it through the tubes, taking advantage of that. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Alan. We'll see you right back here next week, okay? I, wink, wink. We're actually going to record another episode, but I just felt like it was I'm supposed to say that. Yeah. However, the people watching at home, no idea. It's going to be time travel for them. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in this week's episode of TechSnap, and we'll see you right back here next week. Bye.